We're going to read or continue reading, start with why. We're going to practice English together by reading this book. And we are finishing the book. Amazing. Like how to bring people together, how to gather people together, how to, how to cheer up. Yeah. Cheer up influence. Yeah. How to bring people together. All of those people who believe what you believe, how to rally. Start with why, but know how it means start with purpose, start with purpose, but no, but you should also know how to do it. Even if you have purpose, you don't know how to do it, then it doesn't work. Energy excites, charisma inspires. So energy excites, but charisma inspires. Ra with a roar. Steve Ballmer, the man who replaced Bill Gates as CEO of Microsoft, bursts into onto the stage with the company's annual global summit meeting burst into means jumped into ran into the stage ran onto the stage burst like very quickly like if someone bursts into a room they open the door and come in quickly that is the meaning of burst so he burst onto the stage of the company's annual commit com, uh, submit meeting. Balmer loves Microsoft. He says so in no uncertain words. He also knows how to pump up a crowd, how to pump up a crowd. Let's go, right? How to pump a crowd. His energy is almost folkloric. He pumps his fists and runs from one end of the stage to the other. He screams what he and he sweats. He screams and he sweats. This reminds me of Tony, uh, Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins, that inspirational speaker guy. So he pumps his fists, fist. He pumps his fists and runs from the end of the stage one end of the stage to the other. He screams and he sweats. He is remarkable to watch and the crowd loves it. As Balmer proves, without a doubt, energy can motivate a crowd, but can it inspire a population? Mm. What happens the next day or the next week when Balmer's energy is not there to motivate his employees? Is energy enough? Is energy enough to keep a company of about 80,000 people focused? Hmm. So, in contrast, Bill Gates is shy and awkward a social misfit. He, he does not fit. He does not fit the stereotype of the leader of a multi-billion dollar corporation. He is not the most energetic public speaker. When Bill Gates speaks, however, people listen with bated breath. They hang on, they hang on every word. When Gates speaks, he doesn't rally a room. He inspires it. Those who hear him take what he says and carry his words with them for weeks. Those who hear him, those who hear him take what he says and carry his words with them for weeks, months or years. Gates doesn't have energy, but Bill Gates inspires. Energy motivates, but charisma inspires. Energy is easy to see, easy to measure, and easy to copy. Charisma is hard to define, near impossible to measure, and too elusive to copy. 
All great leaders have charisma, because all great leaders have clarity of why, an undying belief in a purpose or cause bigger than themselves. It's not Bill Gates' passion for computers that inspires us. It's his undying optimism that even the most complicated problems can be solved. He believes we can find ways to remove obstacles, to ensure that everyone can live and work to their greatest potential. It is his optimism to which we are drawn. Living through the computer revolution, he saw the computer as a perfect technology to help us all become more productive and achieve our greatest potential. This, that belief inspired his vision of a PC on every desk to come to life. Ironic considering Microsoft never even made PCs. It wasn't just what computers did that Gates saw, the impact for the new technology. It was why we needed them. Today, the work he does with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has nothing to do with software, but it is another way he has found to bring his why to life. He is looking for ways to solve problems. He still has an undying belief, and he still believes that if we can help people, this time, those with less privilege, remove some seemingly simple obstacles, then they too will have an opportunity to be more productive and lift themselves up to achieve their great potential. For Gates, all that has changed, all that has changed is what he's doing to bring his cause to life. Charisma has nothing to do with energy. It comes from clarity, from a clarity of why. It comes from a clarity of why. It comes from absolute conviction in an ideal bigger than oneself. Energy, in contrast, comes from a good night's sleep or <laughs> a lot of caffeine. <laughs> Let me sip my coffee, but speaking of caffeine, you guys, this is so true. Let's go. That's energy. So energy, in contrast, comes from a good night's sleep or lots of caffeine. Energy can excite, but only charisma can inspire. Charisma commands. Loyalty. Energy does not. Energy can always be injected into an organization to motivate people to do things. Bonuses, promotions, other, other carrots and a few sticks can get people to work harder, for sure. But the gains are like all the manipulations. Like all manipulations, short term. It's very short term. Over time, such tactics cost more money and increase stress for employees and employer alike. The same way. And eventually will become the main reason people show up for work every day. That's not loyalty. That's the employee version of repeat business. Loyalty among employees is when they turn down more money or benefits to continue working at the same company. Loyalty to a company trumps pay and benefits. Trump. What is the meaning of Trump? This is, a, this is an important word, actually. So loyalty to a company trumps pay and benefits is more important or is higher than pay and benefits. And unless you are an astronaut, it's not the work we do that inspires us either. It's the cause we come to work for. We don't want to come to work to build a wall. That's so funny. Trump vocabulary, like it means it's more important. 
it's a it's a word but then we have a wall <laughs> it's funny and then by the way this book was written like 15 years ago so it has nothing to do with building a wall so huge so is the cause we come to work for should i leave that like donald trump we don't want to come to work to build a wall we want to come to work to build a cathedral it'll be so amazing it'll be so incredible oh it'll be huge the chosen path the chosen path raised in ohio 60 miles from dayton neil neil armstrong grew up on a healthy diet of stories about the wright brothers do you guys remember the wright brothers it was in chapter one and uh i think in the previous chapters the wright brothers so ohio all right so from a very early age he dreamed of flying He'd make model airplanes, read magazines about flying and stare the heavens through a telescope mounted on the roof of his house. He even got his pilot's license before he got his driver's license. With a childhood passion that became reality, Armstrong was destined to become an astronaut. For the rest of us, however, our career paths, our careers paths, our career paths, are more like Jeff Sumter's. Yo enseño el español y me, y me enseña el inglés. Perfecto. While Sumter was in high school, his mother arranged for him to, to get a summer internship at the bank where she worked. Four years after he finished high school, he called a bank to see if he could do some part-time work, and they eventually offered him a full-time job. Wamo, Wamo, it's an interesting name. Jeff's, what? It's a word. What is Wamo? to figure out what's Wamo. Is it a person? I'm so confused. Informal. What? Wamo. Informal interjection. Anyways, it's not important. It's not a common word, so I don't really care. Jeff's got a career as a banker. In fact, after 15 years in the industry, he and and a colleague by the name of Trey Most went on to start their own bank, Lewis and Clark Bank in Portland, Oregon. Sumter is very good at what he does. He's been one of the top performing loan officers throughout his career. He's well liked and well re respected among his colleagues and clients. Colleague. Colleague is... Uh, colleague, co-worker, people you work with. But even Jeff will admit that he doesn't have much of a passion for banking, per se. Though he's not living out his childhood dream, he is passionate for something. It's not what he does that gets him out of bed every morning. It's why he does it. Our career paths are largely incidental. I never planned to be doing what I'm doing now. As a kid, I wanted to be an uh, aeronautical engineer. But in college, I set my sights on becoming a criminal prosecutor. While I was in law school, however, I was disillusioned with the idea of being a lawyer. It just didn't feel right. I was at law school where the law is one of the last truly English professions. Not wearing a pinstriped suit to an interview could hurt my chances of getting a job. 
This was not my cup of tea. What is cup of tea? Author talking about himself. He is, uh, he lives in New York. I'm talking about Simon Sinek. He's from New York, but his mother is from England. So I happen to be dating a young woman who was studying marketing a uh, Syracuse University. She could see what inspired me and what frustrated me about the law and suggested I try my hand in the field. Now, there you go. <laughs> this is crazy. I said this word is not common and then there you go. Wamo. Wamo or Waymo? I, I don't know. I don't really care. I actually don't like the word. It does not look cool or sound cool. I like bingo better. I've gotten myself a new career in marketing. And that's just one of the things I've done. It's not my passion and it's not how I define my life. My cause to inspire people to do things that inspire them is why I get out of bed every day. The excitement is trying to find new ways Different what's to bring my cause to life. Of which this book is one. I really like this. I always say, well, I don't always say, but ever since reading this book years ago and other books, I learned more about my purpose in life. And, uh, and I truly believe if you wake up in the morning feeling excited about something to like you look forward to something in the day in instead of like being, oh, I'm just another day. I think you will uh, live a good life of purpose. Like if you wake up in the morning feeling good and feeling excited about work or looking forward to something every day, uh, it will make your life meaningful. So. Regardless of what we do in our lives, our why, our driving purpose, cause, or belief never changes. This is very true. It doesn't matter what job you have. If you have a clear why, it will not change. If our golden circle is in balance, what we do is simply the tangible way we find to breathe life into that cause. If our golden circle is in balance, what we do is simply the tangible way we find to breathe life into that cause. Developing software was merely one of the things Bill Gates did to bring his cause to life. An airline gave Herb Keller the perfect outlet to spread his belief in freedom. Putting a man on the moon was one goal John F. Kennedy used to rally people to bring to life his belief that service to the, to the nation and not being served by the nation would lead America to advance and prosper. Apple gave Steve Jobs a way to challenge the status quo and do something big in the world. All the things, all the things these charismatic leaders did were the tangible ways they found to bring their wives to life. But none of them could have changed, could have imagined what they would be doing when they were young. When a why is clear, those who share that belief will be drawn to it and maybe want to take part in bringing it to life. If that belief is amplified, amplified, that's a good word. Amplified means made bigger. And uh, if that belief is magnified and a lot of people believe in it. It can have the power to rally even more believers to raise their hand and declare, I want to help with a group of, group of what? Believers all rallying around a common purpose, cause or belief that amazing things can happen. But it takes more than inspiration to become great. Inspiration only starts the process. You need something more to drive a movement. Amplify the source of inspiration. 
The Golden Circle is not just a communication tool. It also provides some insight into how great organizations are organized. As we start to add dimension to the concept of the Golden Circle, it's no longer helpful to look at it as purely two-dimensional model. If it's to provide any real value in how to build a great organization in our very three-dimensional world, the golden circle needs to be three-dimensional. The good news is, it is. It is, in fact, a top-down view of a cone. Turn it, turn it on its side and you can see its full value. Interesting. The cone, like an ice cream cone, the cone, like this, represents a company or organization, inherently hierarchical, an organized system, an inherently hierarchical and organized system, sitting at the top of the system representing the why, is a leader. In the case of a company, that's usually the CEO, or at least we hope it is. The next level down, the how level, the how level, typically includes the senior executives who are inspired by the leader's vision and know how to bring it to life. Don't forget that a why is just a belief. Hows are the actions we take to realize that belief and what's are the results of those actions. No matter how charismatic or inspiring the leader is, if there are not people in the organization inspired to bring that vision to reality, to build an infrastructure with systems and processes, then at best, inefficiency reigns. Inefficiency means not enough. Then it will not be successful and failure results. Inefficiency reigns failure results. In this rendering, the how level represents a person or a small group responsible for building the infrastructure that the infrastructure that can make a why tangible, tangible, physical, bring it, bring it to life. You can touch it. You can feel it. That is tangible. So to make a why clear. That may happen in marketing, operations, finance, uh, human resources, and all other C-suit departments. Beneath that, at the what level, is where the rubber meets the road. It is at, the level, at this level that the majority of the employees sit and where all the tangible stuff actually happens. This is pretty deep. So you can have all the inspiration. You can have all the purpose and all the whys and all the ideas. If you don't have the house, if you don't have your team, the people to, to bring these ideas to life, and if you don't have the people to bring the action, to get the stuff done on the, on the, on the floor, then your whys and your ideas will just stay the same. I have a dream and he's got the plan. Dr. King said he had a dream and he inspired people to make his dream their own. What Ralph Aber, Abernathy, Abernathy, whatever, I don't know. What Ralph lent the movement was something else. He knew that it would take what it would take to realize that dream, and he showed people how to do it. He gave the dream structure. Dr. King spoke about the philosophical implications of the movement. While Abernathy, Abernathy, I need to know this name because he was the how of Martin Luther King's why. Dr. King's one-time mentor. Okay, he was his mentor. Okay. Longtime friend and financial secretary and treasurer and treasurer of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference would help people understand the specific steps needed to take. Now, 
Abernathy would tell the audience following a rousing address by Dr. King. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what that means for tomorrow morning. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the leader, but he didn't change America alone. He didn't change America alone. Though Dr. King inspired the movement to actually move people, even though Dr. King inspired the movement, but to, in, to actually move people requires organizing, as is the case with almost all great leaders. There were others around Dr. King who knew better how to do that. For every great leader, for every Y type, there is an inspired how type or group of how types who take the intangible cause and build the infrastructure that can give it life. That infrastructure is what actually makes any measurable change to or success possible. This is pretty deep, you guys. This is pretty, pretty deep. The leader sits at the top of the cone. At the start, the point of why. While the how types sit below and are responsible for actually making things happen. The leader imagines the destination. This is pretty, pretty powerful. The leader, the person with the why, imagines the destination. And the how types, the how types find the route to get there. A destination without a route leads to meandering and uh, efficiency. Something great many Y types will experience without the help of others to ground them. A route without a destination, however, may be efficient. But to what end? It's, it's all fine and good to know how to drive, but it's more fulfilling when you have a place to go. I've been looking for this quote for such a long time. It's nice to have a car, but what's the point if you don't know where to go? So I made that quote out of this, but this is the original one. It's all fine and good to know how to drive, but it's more fulfilling. It's more meaningful when you have a place to go. When you have a destination that you're trying to reach, when you have a goal, purpose, right? For Dr. King, Rolf Abernathy, Abernathy, Abernathy was one of the one of these one of those he inspired and who knew how to make the cause actionable and tangible. So Ralph was the driver. Dr. King's job was to interpret the ideology and theology of nonviolence. So Dr. King was the one with the GPS. Said Aberson, my Abernathy, my job was more simple and down to earth. I would tell people, don't ride those buses. In every case of a great charismatic leader who ever achieved anything of significance, there was always a person or small group lurking in the shadows who knew how to take the vision and make it a reality. Dr. King had a dream, but no matter how inspiring a dream may be, a dream that cannot come to life stays a dream. Yeah. A dream, I repeat. A dream that cannot come to life stays a dream. A dream that cannot become a reality stays a dream. So guys, whatever dream you have, go out there and try to realize them. Or go out there and follow it. It doesn't matter. You don't have to go all the way to the end. But if you don't try it, you will never know. Dr. King... Dr. King dreamed of many of the same things as countless other African Americans who grew up in the pre-civil rights South. He spoke of many of the same themes. He felt the same outrage perpetrated by an unjust system. But it was King's unflappable 
optimism and his words that inspired a population. Dr. King didn't change America by himself. He wasn't a legislator, for example, but legislation was created to give all people in the United States equal rights, regardless of skin color. It wasn't Dr. King who changed America. It was the movement of millions of others whom he inspired that changed the course of history. But how do you organize millions of people? Forget millions. How do you organize hundreds or, or tens of people? The vision and charisma of the leader are enough to attract the innovators and the early adopters, trusting their guts and their intuition. These people will make the greatest sacrifices to help see the vision become a reality. This is very true. Very, very true. With each success, with every tangible demonstration, that vision can in fact become reality. The more, the more practical minded majority starts wait. With, great, with each success, with every tangible demonstration, that vision can in fact become reality. The more practical-minded majority starts to take interest. What was previously just a dream soon becomes a provable and tangible reality. And when that happens, a tipping point can be reached. And then... Things really get moving. By the way, this is a huge matchstick. I'm going to make a fire. Those who know why need those people who know the process. Pessimist, someone who is a negative person with a negative personality, the opposite of optimist. Thank you, Hala Madrid, for joining. Wow. Hala Madrid, you know what I'm saying? The pessimists are, are usually right, to paraphrase. To paraphrase Thomas Friedman, author of The World is Flat, and it's the optimists who change the world. Bill Gates imagined a world in which the computer would help us all reach our greatest potential, and it happened. Now he imagines a world in which malaria does not exist. And it will happen. The Wright brothers imagined a world in which we would uh, all take to the skies as easily as we catch the bus. And it happened. Why types have the power to change the course of industries or even the world? If only they knew how. If only they knew how. If only they had the people around them to help them. Why types are the visionaries. Visionary, people with dreams and big, big, big visions. Visionaries. So the white type people are the visionaries. The ones with the overactive imaginations, they tend to be optimists who believe that all the things they imagine can actually be accomplished. How types live more in the here and now. How types live more in the here and the now? They are what? They are the realists. Realists. They're realistic and have a clear sense of all things practical. Why types are focused on the things most people can't see, like the future. How types are focused on the things most people can see and tend to be better at building structures and processes and getting things done. One is not better than the other. They are just different ways people naturally see and experience the world. So what do you think? What do you think, guys? Are you a why type? Are you a how type? Or are you a what type person? How types are focused on things most people can see and tend to be better in building structures and processes and getting things done. One is not better, better than the other. They are just different ways people naturally see and experience the world. Gates is a white type. So 
were the Wright brothers and Steve Jobs and Herb Keller. But they didn't do it alone. They couldn't. They needed those who knew how. They needed those who knew how. Like Steve Jobs, he, had, he, had a, he was a visionary. He had all the visions. But of course, he needed engineers to get the job done, to bring his, life, his vision to life. If it hadn't been for, for my big brother, I, had, I would have been in jail several times for checks bouncing, said Walt Disney. Only half joking to a Los Angeles audience in 1957. I never knew what was in the bank. He kept me on the straight and narrow. Walt Disney was a Y type, a dreamer. Whose, name, whose dream came true thanks to the help of his more sensible older brother, Roy, a how type. Walt Disney began his career creating cartoon, cartoon drawings for advertisements, but moved quickly to making animated movies. It was 1923 in Hollywood and was emerging as the heart, heart of the movie business. And Walt wanted to be a part of it. Roy, who was eight years older, had been working at a bank. Roy was always in awe of his brother's talent and imagination. This is a good word, in awe. In awe means so inspired, so inspired. Like he was in awe of his brother's talent. He was like, oh my God, you are so... You are so creative or you're so inspiring. You're so in awe. But he also knew that Walt was prone to taking risks and to neglecting business affairs. Business matters. Business deals. Like all Y guys, Walt was busy thinking about what the future looked like and often forgot he was living in the present. Walt Disney dreamed, drew, and imagined. Roy stayed in the shadow, forming an empire, wrote Bob Thomas, a Disney biographer, a brilliant financer and businessman. Roy helped turn Walt Disney's dreams into reality. Building the company that bears his brother's name. It was Roy who founded the Buena Vista Distribution Company that made Disney films a central part of American childhood. It was Roy who created the merchandising business that transformed Disney characters into household names. And like almost every how type, Roy never wanted to be the front man. He never wanted to be the front man. He preferred to stay in the background and focus on how to build his brother's vision. This is pretty, pretty, pretty powerful, guys. Very powerful. He wanted to stay in the shadows. He did not want to be the front man. Most people in the world are how types. Most people in the world are how types. Most people are quite functional in the real world and can do their jobs and do, then do very well. Some may be very successful and even make millions of dollars, but they will never build billion dollar businesses or change the world. How types don't need why types to do well. But why guys, for all their vision and imagination, often get the short end of the stick. Without someone inspired by their vision and the knowledge to make it a reality, most Y types end up as starving visionaries. People with all the answers, but never accomplishing much themselves. This is very, very deep. Very true. Although so many of them fancy themselves visionaries, in reality, most successful entrepreneurs are how types. 
Ask an entrepreneur what they love about being an entrepreneur. And most will tell you they love to build things. That they talk about building is sure clue that they know how to get things done. A business is a structure, systems, and processes that need to be assembled. It is the how types who are mo more adept, more adept at building those processes and systems. But most companies, no matter how well built, do not become billion dollar businesses or change the course of industries. To reach the billion dollar status, to alter the course, to change the course of an industry, requires a very, very special, rare partnership between one who knows why and those who know how. In nearly every case of a person or organization that has gone, to, gone on to inspire people and do great things, there exists this special partnership between why and how. Bill Gates, for example, may, may have been the visionary who imagined a world with a PC on every desk, but Paul Allen built the company. Herb Keller was able to personify and preach the cause of freedom, but it was Roland King who came up with the idea for Southwest Airlines. Steve Jobs was the rebel's evangelist, but Steve Wozniak is the engineer who made the Apple work. Jobs had the vision. Woz had the goods. It is the partnership of a vision of the future and the talent to get it done that makes an organization an organization great this relationship to starts to clarify the difference between a vision statement and a mission statement in an organization the vision is the public statement of a founder's intent why the company exists it's literally 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 it's literally the vision of a future it's literally the vision of a future. Repeat with me, guys. Repeat with me. It's literally, it's not it is, it's, you say it together. It's, it's literally, it's literally, it's literally, it's literally the vision of a future. This is a quick uh, reading and pronunciation practice. A lot of times in English, guys, just like every other language, you put words together. You don't say word, 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 word. That's not how English works. Pay attention when I'm reading because I don't say word, 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 word. It's literally together, one word, and then. So it's literally the vision of a future, of a future, not of a future. It's literally the vision. It's literally the vision of a future. The vision of a future. The vision of a future. It's literally the vision of a future that does not yet exist. The mission statement is a, you see, I don't say is a, is a. The mission statement is a description of the route, the guiding principles, how the company intends to create the future that future. When both of those things are stated clearly, the why type and the how type are both certain about their goals in the partnership. Both. Both are working together with clarity. Both are working together with, of, with clarity of purpose and a plan to get there. For it to work, however, it requires more than a set of skills. It requires trust. It requires trust. Trusting relationships are invaluable for us to feel safe. This, it doesn't matter. It's, it's business, it's relationship, whatever. When there's no trust, you can't succeed. You cannot be successful. So trusting relationships are invaluable for us to feel safe. Our ability to trust people or organizations 
allows us to take risks and feel supported in our efforts. And perhaps, and maybe, the most trusting relationship exists that exists is between the visionary and the builder, the why guy and the how guy. In organizations able to inspire, the, rest, the best cheap executives are why types, people who wake up every day to lead a cause and not just run a company. In these organizations, the best chief financial officers and chief operating officers are high-performing how types. Those with the strength, with the strength of ego, to admit they are not visionaries themselves, but are inspired by their leader's vision and know how to build the structure can bring, can bring it to life. The best how types generally do not want to be out preaching the vision. They prefer to work behind the scenes to build the systems that can make the vision a reality. It takes the combined skill and effort of both for great things to happen. It's not an accident that these unions of why and how are often come from families or old relationship or old friendships. A shared upbringing and life experience increases the probability of a shared set of values and beliefs. In the case of family or childhood friends, upbringing and upbringing means like the way you were raised and common experiences are nearly exactly the same. That's not to say you can't find a good partner somewhere else. It's that growing up with somebody and having a common life experience increases the livelihood, the likelihood of a shared common worldview. Worldview means the way you see the world. Walt Disney. Walt Disney. I actually didn't know about his brother. Walt Disney and Roy Disney were brothers. Bill Gates and Paul Allen went to high school together in Seattle. Herb Keller was Rawling King's divorce attorney and old friend. Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Albernathy both preached in Birmingham long before the civil rights movement took form. And Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were best friends in high school. The list goes on. The list continues. To run or to lead. To run or to lead. For all the talented how types running today's organizations, they can achieve success that will last their lifetimes. But they will spend their lifetime running their companies. There are many ways to be successful and drive profits. Any number of manipulations, only some of which I have touched upon in this book, work quite well. So manipulation works. Even the ability to create a tipping point is possible without creating lasting change. It's called a fad. With great organizations, function but great organizations function exactly like any social movement. They inspire people. They inspire people to talk about a product or idea. Include that product in context of their lifestyle. Share the idea or even find ways to advance the prosperity of the organization itself. Great organizations not only excite the human spirit, they inspire people to take part in helping to advance the cause without needing to pay them or incentivize them in any particular way particular way no cashback incentives or mail-in rebates required people feel compelled to spread the word not because they have to but because they want to they willingly take up arms to share the message that inspires them if, if you have a belief or an idea, go out and spread it, and those who believe will follow.
after three months election process, DCA finally chose a new ad agency to help develop a campaign to launch their new product line. Good Company Incorporated is a well-known brand operating in a fairly cluttered market space. As a manufacturer... So their products are sold via third-party sales force, only on the shelves of big box realtors, re retailers, retailers, <laughs> retailers, retailers as they don't have direct control over the sales process. The best they can do is to try to influence the sale from a distance with marketing. BCI is a good company with a strong culture. The employees respect the management and in general, the company does good work. But over the years of competition, over the years, the competition has grown fairly stiff. Fairly stiff means not making a lot of uh, a lot of uh, strong or big movement or growth. Stiff, not moving fast. And uh, although BCI has a good product and competitive pricing, it is still tough to maintain strong growth year over year. This year, BCI management is particularly excited because the company, the company is launching. What is the meaning of launch? Putting into put, putting something into the market, like a new product, is launching. So the company is launching a new product. They really think will make BCI stand out, stand out, make BCI stand out. To help promote it, BCI's agency has launched major new a new major wait launch a major new ad campaign from the leading maker says the new ad comes the newest most in innovative product you've ever seen. The ad goes on to talk about all the new features and benefits and includes something about quality you've come to expect from BCI. Something BCI executives felt quite strongly about, including BCI executives have worked hard to build their company's reputation and they want to leverage it. They want to take advantage of it. Leverage is a good word. They want to leverage it. So. They are very excited about their new campaign and are re really banking on the success of this product to help drive sales in general. They know they do good work and they want to get the message out. They need it to be loud. The megaphone, right? With a budget of millions of dollars to advertise this new product, their new product in that respect, BCI succeeds, or not really, but there's a problem. BCI and their agencies did a good job of telling people about their new product. The work was quite creative. They were able to explain what was new and special about their latest innovation. But focus groups agreed that the new product was much better than the competition. The millions of dollars in media ensured that lots of people would see their advertising and see it often. Their reach and frequency, the measurement commonly used by ad agencies to gauge the number of people exposed to the advertising was very good. So their reach and frequency was very good. There is no doubt that their message was loud. The problem was it wasn't clear. So you have to have a clear message. doesn't matter uh, how loud you are if you're not clear about what you're saying. So the problem was it wasn't clear. It was all what's and how, but no why. So they had no... 
So yeah. Even even though people learned what the product did, no one knew what BCI believed. The good news is, it's not a complete loss. The products will sell as long as the ads are on the air and promotions remain competitive. It's an effective strategy, but an expensive way to make money. What if Martin Luther King had delivered a comprehensive 12-point plan about achieving civil rights in America, a plan more comprehensive than any other plan for civil rights ever offered? Booming through the speakers that summer's day in 1963, his message would have been loud. Microphones like advertising and PR are fantastic for making sure a message is heard. Like BCI, King's message would still have reached thousands of people, but his belief would not have been clear. So true. Volume is reasonably easy to achieve. All it takes is money or stunts. Money can pay, can pay to keep a message front and center. And publicity stunts are good at getting on the news. But neither plants seeds of loyalty. Neither one. What is the meaning of this word, plant? It's used as a verb. Publicity or volume. Neither means none of these. Neither. Plants, seeds of loyalty. Creates or grows seeds of loyalty. Many people reading this may remember that Oprah Winfrey once gave away a free car to every member of her studio audience. It happened several years ago, in 2004, and still people refer to the stunt. How many can recall the model of car she gave away? That's the problem. It was Pontiac that donated $7 million worth of cars, 276 of their new G6 model, to be exact. It was Pontiac, right? And it was Pontiac that saw the stunt as a way to market their new car. Yet, although the stunt worked well to reinforce Oprah's generous nature, something with which we're all familiar, a few remember, only a few people remember that Pontiac was a part of the event. Worse, the stunt didn't do anything to reinforce some purpose, cause or believe that Pontiac represents. We had no idea what Pontiac's why was before the stunt. And it's hard for the publicity stunt to do much more than that. Well, be a stunt to get some publicity. With no sense of why there's nothing else it's doing. For a message to have real impact, to affect behavior and seed loyalty, it needs more than publicity. It needs to publicize some higher purpose, cause, or belief to which those with similar values and beliefs can relate. Only then can the message create any lasting mass market success. For a stunt to appeal to the left side of the curve of the law of diffusion, why the stunt is being performed beyond the desire to generate press must be clear. So for a stunt uh, to the left side, why, why must be clear. Though there may be short-term benefits without clarity, loud is nothing more than excessive volume. Loud is nothing than excessive volume. Or in business vernacular, clutter. Clutter, mess. Clutter means mess, stuff. So, and companies wonder... Why differentiation is such a challenge these days? Have you heard the volume coming from some of them? In contrast, what would have been the impact of Dr. King's speech had he not had a microphone and loudspeakers? His vision would have been no less clear. His words would have been no less inspiring. 
He knew what he believed, and he spoke with passion and charisma about that belief. But only the few people with front row seats would have been inspired by those words. A leader with with a cause, whether it whether it be an individual or an organization, must have a megaphone through which to deliver his message. This is very very powerful. You still need a megaphone, although through which to deliver his message. And it must be clear and loud to work. Clarity of purpose, cause, or belief is important, but it is equally important that people hear you. For a why to have the power to move people, it must not be. It must not only be clear. It must be amplified. It must be made bigger to reach enough people to dip the scale. It's no coincidence that the three-dimensional golden circle is a cone. It is, in practice, a megaphone. An organization effectively becomes the vessel through which a person with a clear cause or belief can speak to the outside world. But for a megaphone to work, clarity must come first. Without a clear message, what will you amplify? The end.